Iron Geek is recording almost all of the sessions. They will be available on Iron Geek. If you miss one session, you'll be able to see it afterwards. Woo! Thank you for doing that. All right, so good morning, St. Louis. I'm, I'm really glad to be here. I'm, I'm, I can't tell you how proud I am of uh, a Dave and this crew right here. Um, uh, who would have thought, you know, that uh, what, five, six years ago, uh, he came into a class and said, you know, I'm thinking of starting a company in St. Louis. And, and now here's, here's this going on. Kind of crazy. So as, uh, as Dave mentioned, I certainly have had quite an interesting trip uh, so far, which originally started with, uh, you know, hacking for porn, as I call it, at 14. Uh, I thought that was kind of fun, and uh, didn't it really end up getting any of that. So uh, what I ended up doing was actually professionally doing this for a living, and now it's been 20 years of, of doing this. And in the last five years, <clears throat> I found myself working with a number of different companies, but specifically with a, an investigations company called Kroll, and I ended up working on all these cases that had to do with entertainment leaks. Specifically, not so much the piracy stuff, but what happens if a movie or footage from a movie gets leaked prior to the release of the movie or the song or the album. So, uh, and that's led me down this road, this rabbit hole in Hollywood, which is kind of really interesting. And I'll tell you a lot more about it. It's, it's a world that most people don't really, especially most people in our uh, industry, really rarely get access to, be on set and actually go through and follow the making of a film from it's the camera and its inception and development all the way through to distribution. Um, and I've got the, uh, I've had the uh, blessing of having worked with some great folks. Like I said, Oliver Stone is a good friend now. Uh, there's a number of different movies in development that I'm working with, uh, some of which I can and can't talk about yet, but it's been a trip. So uh, a little overview here is, uh, I'm not even going to start with the motive and stuff. I have, I'd like to start with a little, uh, old school hacking. What's the password? Password? No. One, two, three, four, five. No. Do you have a dog? Yeah, her name's Muffin. Is a password Muffin? Yes, it is. Come on in. Well, the funny thing about this is this is still true to this day. Um, and in fact, even more so in Hollywood than anywhere, because uh, most people don't realize that there is no such thing as an IT department in the making of a movie. And there's certainly no such thing as a security department in the making of a movie. There may be an IT department at Universal and Warner Brothers, but there isn't an IT department in the making of a movie. Okay, so the production life cycle of a film, which is kind of mind-blowing when you think about the fact that they're spending, I don't know, 100 million, 200, 300 million dollars making a movie. You know how many startups we can start in here with 300 million dollars? Uh, and they don't really get the fact that it's all digital. So they still have this mentality that there's a can of film and they're like carrying it around. And that's not the case. Even uh, in the, those cases like Savages, we shot it on film, but that film was never used. It was really only used to capture it, but the moment it's being captured, it's being encoded into, into some sort of digital format. You have things like camera assist, which are what you're looking at when the film is being shot. And all of that is digital. There is no editing done that is not digital. So the entire process is a digital process. And sure, they know Final Cut, and they know Avid, and they know all these different things, but they really have no idea how vulnerable this is. And one of the biggest things that they often come to me with is, well, what's, what's the motive? Uh, you know, well, the motive now for a lot of hacking is no longer curiosity, and especially when it comes to things of this nature. It's really money. It's all financially focused for, let's say, the, the black hats of the world. And it, it really just doesn't start with it being targeted. In fact, most of the leaks that I've had to deal with was as a result of non-targeted phishing attacks, which ended up on the inbox of, say, some major director or some major writer. Um, so it, it really is financially motivated once they figure out, hey, can we, is there any way to monetize this? And I'll talk about one. There's a little-known rapper from Detroit. There's only two rappers in Detroit that aren't well-known. That uh, whose album leaked, and uh, you would never imagine what was really behind that. It was financially motivated. You had somebody willing to pay five thousand dollars a song so that they could be DJ leaks on the internet, and they could say 
we've got the song before anybody else does. That's it. And this person was willing to pay five grand. Was he the hacker? No. There was a group of hackers in Germany, and there was a broker in England who took care of the money going back and forth. Who would have thought that that was actually going on? I certainly didn't, right? Um, so money is the motive. Financial gain is the motive. And if they can't figure out how to monetize data, in this case, content, then they're just going to troll them. It's that simple. So well, what do I mean by trolling? If you guys don't know this yet, the Urban Dictionary says, this is being a prick on the internet because you can be. <clears throat> you know, typically, you want to unleash one or more cynical or sarcastic remarks or, or an innocent by, on an innocent bystander because it's the internet. And hey, it's the internet. We can do that. Um, trolls intentions. Well, what are the intentions? Again, if it's not financial, then what are the intentions? Well, obviously sabotage, disruption, uh, basically to trigger conflict of some sort. Okay. So it could be vandalism for attention, you name it. So really that's the big concern because I can spend an hour talking about financial impact, but for the most part, they don't get it, to be honest with you. Exe executives don't get it. Creatives don't quite get it. So when you start talking about trolling, uh, it can get really fun there. What is one of the biggest issues? Well, like I said, one of the things that, uh, that happens when you, when a, once a movie has been green, greenlit is that they're going to now start pre-production. And from the process of pre-production, which basically means planning, let's plan out everything. There's a lot of data gathered. Everybody's name, phone numbers, email addresses, service providers for visual effects, service providers for post, dailies, you name it. All this stuff that they have going on. Of course, all digital, mind you. Um, and there is no IT department. In the film world, the closest thing, or at least during production, to IT is a guy called a data wrangler, or a DIT person, which stands for Digital Imaging Technologists. It has nothing to do with IT. They're actually part of the camera department. So they're basically want to, you know, they're lower in the totem pole, but they want to be filmmakers. They want to be DPs, directors of photography. And they start down there, and their job is to take the content out of the camera, put it on a hard drive, make a copy of it, upload it to dailies. That's it. That's the only IT department on it during the production of the film. So everybody on set is using personal email addresses. There is no such thing as corporate email, with the exception of the two or three people back at Universal who are the executives or Warner Brothers or wherever. Everyone else is using a Gmail, Yahoo, Hotmail, whatever account. And this is how they're all communicating and sending each other all kinds of different things. So as you guys know, this is a, this is a big problem. Uh, mobile devices are on set everywhere. From now camera assist going to iPads, where I, they, you can just bring an iPad and watch what's, what's being shot from you know, a, a whole other room away to, uh, of course, everybody is using their cell phones. And this is one of the biggest uh, attack vectors that we see is that it's a BYOD environment. Unlike that term of BYOD is something they have no idea about because it's always been BYOD. We've been discussing BYOD now for our organizations, but over there it's all BYOD. So everybody's bringing their own devices, their own laptops. This is how it's all done. And other than that, everything else that they're using is leased. And you'd be surprised how many times leased equipment goes back to the company with content on it. There isn't any policies or procedures to clean that data off of these hard drives, off of these cameras. It just goes right back. So with the mobile devices, they're a lot more vulnerable to phishing attacks uh, because one of the things is that URLs, if you're, most people aren't going to go and enter a long URL. If you're sent a link, you're going to click on that link. And it's real easy to make that link look like a legitimate link. And behind the link, it's not a legitimate link. So users are very prone to clicking on it, uh, on any link they're being sent. Hey, check out the, the latest dailies from today. Here's the link. Hey, check out what we're looking at for wardrobe. Hey, check out all these different things. Now this, for a movie that's unknown to most of us, doesn't really matter. But I'll give you a good example. Right now, J.J. Abrams is the new director of Star Wars. and He's just quite a budget. It's something close to $500 million for the next Star Wars. It will be probably the most expensive. Currently, it's Spider-Man. Star Wars will be the most expensive film produced by Hollywood. 
uh, just for production, just so you can imagine how much money they're spending on physical security, they are in the process of building a $30 million production facility in Santa Monica just for Star Wars. They're not shooting anything else there, just Star Wars. And I know from having been on set at, at some of the uh, Star Trek, the last Star Trek, I mean, they even set up uh, these sort of rooms where you're not even allowed to see the other person's outfit. Unless you're in the same scene, you'll never even see each other. All these corridors and all these things. And so they, they know all about the physical side because that's the way they've been working all, you know, for years and years and years. Um, however, they really have no idea how vulnerable they are from the digital side. Very few of us, I mean, we do all kinds of vulnerability research and all kinds of different hardware. Uh, I'm the first that I know to be doing <coughs> vulnerability research uh, on media devices that are used in Hollywood. Uh, all these red cameras and all these different things, all of them have wireless capabilities. Um, I mean, you could be a mile away and do some serious damage while the shooting is going on, which is crazy. So, and again, the, the biggest threat in attack vector is the fact that email is generally how everything is dealt with. Again, all these mobile devices, again, you can't even see the full URL. Very easy to get the user to uh, click on stuff and easily get them to, to a malicious code. Uh, the other concern is, and this is one of the things I talked about last year in Emerging Threats, is app stores and patches and updates to mobile devices. Um, just a few days ago, was, uh, we were actually in Dallas doing another talk where I did that Emerging Threats talk, and Jason was there, who you'll see later. And... Um, you know, we were having this discussion with one of the guys from BlackBerry about the app stores because that is one of the areas where, you know, they're supposed to be doing all this, this testing before they allow an app to go on the app store. But what do you think the potential for malware inside of these apps are if properly written? Uh, that's a major concern too. Not to mention users are not actually updating those apps as quickly as you would think. Um, so in one example here, um, what I'd like to do is, and this is the oldest trick in the book, in 2007, when Voice over IP came out, um, myself and several other researchers worked on uh, all kinds of different security problems and flaws with, within Voice over IP. And one of those had to do with caller ID, right? Um, so in 2007, and that article is still out there, I had a call from a, a reporter from the Washington Post, I think it was, who called and said, hey, uh, we heard about something called caller ID spoofing. And, can, can we talk about it? And I said, sure. Uh, give me your number and I'll call you back. So, waited a few minutes. I called a friend and I said, hey, I was driving at the time. Can you give me the phone number for the White House uh, press line? And he went on the White House website and pulled up the phone number, gave it to me. And a few minutes later, I called this reporter back from the White House's press line. And this guy answered the phone like, hello? Like, uh, how can I help you? I said, this is Ralph. And he said, yes, Ralph with the White House press office. No, Ralph, the guy you called about caller ID spoofing. Because his caller ID said the White House. So I said, well, there you go. That's how it works. Um, it's that simple. Um, and now there's an app for that. In fact, there's few apps for that. Same thing goes with, doesn't work quite as well with uh, text spoofing, right? So uh, imagine in Hollywood now. It's not really all that difficult to figure out somebody's phone number. Okay, and especially to figure out the main number for a company like, say, Universal Pictures, right? So now you look at your phone and you're an assistant, which, by the way, I've never seen more assistants than in Hollywood. I mean, assistants have assistants in Hollywood. Um, everybody's, got a, everybody's got a PA, personal assistant. Um, during the filming of Savages, Oliver had a PA on set. He had a PA off set. He had a PA at the office. These are all people who have more power than they realize because they can kind of pre-set up any kind of situation. So we basically uh, call from, say, Oliver Stone's office uh, to the assistant and say, hey, this is so-and-so, and we have somebody coming on set. He's going to call you. Please give him directions to set and make sure he gets well taken care of. And that's all it took. All they did was trust the number they saw on the phone. And that's just one example of hacking mobile trust. Now, we can do this here. Does anybody want to get their uh, call, uh, you know, phone call from their mother or something? 
And, and it won't be your mom. It'll be me. Come on. Don't, don't be afraid. Come on. Somebody. Somebody. I know you all have cell phones. Who wants to be? All right. Come on up. I have to be the guy all the way to the back. Come on, guys. So, it's a, again, nowadays, it's a, it's a real simple thing, even more so than it ever was before. And uh, the truth is, is that this is, like email, one of the biggest attack vectors for anyone is, you know, to call them from a number they trust. So, you don't have to say it out loud, but um, just give me a number. Hold on. Hang on one second. And the funny thing is, is that, you know, if you go look at your, from a forensic perspective, if I were to go and look at my uh, logs, uh, or even look at the ISP's logs in this case, it would not be traceable back to the way I'm doing it. So, it would not be usable in court. So, hold on, go to this side. Mm -hmm. Okay, now that's, that's, is that your number? Okay, hold on, hold on. Okay. Yeah. All right, I so. I he's sucking all my bank information out of my phone. Never. This is an ethical hacking conference, people. So, you have your phone on you? You have a signal? Just making sure. Now, uh, now answer it. Did it already end? Oh, okay. Hold on. You gave me the wrong number. I just got this. <laughs> <laughs> it won't work if it's the wrong number, people. Okay, that's, that's kind of... Hang on. Somebody else got a call from the FBI just a minute ago, so... No problem. So now here's the funny thing, because uh, because uh, we did this in class for some of the students that were in the uh, hacking class with Dave, and you know the joke I always like to play is you know find out what their mom's number is or their girlfriend's number is, and uh, you know one of the cool things is that you know we can okay hang on what's your number and then any number you know by heart. All right. Hopefully this is the right number. Um, and what I'm going to do here, so you guys can just see, you know, social engineering is one of my uh, specialties. It's a lot of fun to do, and I like doing it in person. Um, and you'll, you'll meet some others out here, too, like Jason, uh, who's also great at doing that. And this is really quite social engineering. So let's see if uh, you get a call here. Now what I'm going to have you do is put the, uh... all right, answer it. Hello. <laughs> okay, no, some chick just said, hey, honey, how you doing? <laughs> no, put, put that up to your, or put it on speakerphone. Now what I want you to notice is. Hey, honey, how you doing? Do you sound like a female? Is that a casino on there? So not only is so, it like, not changing, only is it like voice, changing my voice, but it's also making, but it's it, sound also like making it sound like I'm in a casino. All right, so, All right, why? so why? This is kind of important. Thank you. Give it up. Now, this is kind of important because background noise is key to one of these type of hacks. If I'm saying that I'm in traffic and I ran into an accident and, you know, I need, uh, I need assistance right away or I need somebody, a common one that I've actually used is to call someone and say that, I mean, this is pretty bad, but, uh, you know, your husband, your wife, your kid has been in an accident and, you know, we need this information. Do you think they're going to give me the information? Absolutely, if it's coming from their number. So, again, trust and trust in a 
technology space is something you should not trust technology. Don't trust anything you see. Question it, and that's why it's, it's really important to learn all these different types of things. Now, uh, when it comes to data leaks, uh, we were talking about that. With, uh, just a few of the ones that I've had to deal with. Um, there's a little thing called Twilight Breaking Dawn. Um, it, you know, I'm sure your kids know about it. Uh, it's about vampires and werewolves. Um, and here's the funny thing about it. Uh, I got a call one day and they said, fly to Vancouver immediately because there's this movie about vampires and werewolves that's been leaked on the internet. 101 different still pictures of dailies were leaked, including the wedding dress. Oh my. And the, uh, you know, the love scene. Oh my. Um, but, they were crazy about this. This is a huge franchise. And uh, it spent four months tracking down what ended up being a 21-year-old Twihard fan in Posadas, Argentina. Middle of nowhere, northern Argentina. Uh, this 21-year-old girl was just a fan. And uh, what happened there was that they, of course, went after her with all their legal might. Uh, and I told them when we were doing all of our forensics, this girl couldn't have been the hacker, okay? She's using Windows 7, for God's sake, okay? <laughs> so, but they decided that's who we're going after. And I said, no, look around her, look at who she's talking to, look for her boyfriend. There's a higher probability that that's who did the hacking. She just did the leaking, and if you go to court with this, you're not going to win, because there's no proof that she did the hacking. There might be proof that she did the leaking, but the other problem with that is she's not the only one that did the leaking. She may have done the majority of the leaking. Now, this is what's really screwed up, and I'm going to tell you about a major legal vulnerability uh, in this Hollywood process. Summit Entertainment, now owned by Lionsgate, lost the case. And they lost the case exactly because of what I was telling you. But here's the interesting part about it. The judge said there is no proof that she did the hacking, number one. He also said there is no proof that she was the only leaker, so we can't hold her accountable for the leaking. But the most interesting part uh, that came out of this uh, judgment was that when a script is not yet a movie, that script is copywritten material. No script that gets made into a movie gets made from the original script. That script has changed a whole bunch of times. They have a script supervisor, that's the, the title of this person, and they sit there and all they do is listen to what the actors say, and if there's changes in it, they change it. Okay? All of those changes throughout the filming of the movie, all the way to the moment of the final edit, are not copywritten materials. So if they get hacked during the filming of a movie, there is no legal recourse against the hacker if the content is not yet copywritten. And you can imagine if you're filming something in... Brazil and the Amazon, how are you going to be sending in copyright requests every day? It's not going to happen. So major, major legal loophole here. So again, they're fighting it, and they're going to try to get this overturned, and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, this is what one of the biggest vulnerabilities and weaknesses that I saw. And then to be kind of blown away by the fact that nobody's actually addressing this. There are millions and billions of dollars being spent on piracy. Okay? The MPAA, for example, is, is, you know, you have no idea how much money they're getting from these four studios to go after pirates. And, uh, you know, look at Pirate Bay. Uh, how long is, have they been trying to take that down? For as long as it's exist existed. And has it actually gone down? No. And is it going to go down? No. So, they're really fighting an uphill battle that they're not going to win when it comes to the issue of piracy once in distribution. There's a lot of things we can do, and now they're changing. In fact, I have a client that um, the issue is not the downloaded content or the downloadable content now. The issue is streaming sites. How many of us actually can go out there and find free TV or any number of different things way easier than we can find it legitimately? And that's what they're not getting. The pirates are doing a better job of providing us the content, the consumer, than they are. Okay, so as long as that continues to go on, people are going to go to the pirate sites. And it's not to download it, it's to stream it. So we're looking at creative ways to affect that. Um, so with that said, 
we, you know, there was a report that came out that, that asked, uh, it was, this was on Information Week in 2013, that said, well, do you believe that your organization can potentially be breached or infiltrated or already has been and you just don't know about it? And 75% of the respondents said, yeah, that's possible that it happened. And 25% said, no, it's not possible. Now, this is generally, these questions were asked of IT departments. And like I said, here's the big disconnect with Hollywood is their IT department has nothing to do with the filming of a movie. Like I said, the way it works is Universal says, we're going to fund that. They give the production company, which by the way, for the most part, production companies are created to spend the money and then they go away. That's the way it works. I, I, I don't even want to get into the finance. I, I had to reverse engineer the financing of Hollywood and it was, uh, one of the most creative financing, I'll call it that, that I've ever seen. In any other, in any other industry, it would be considered fraudulent, what they're doing. Like, you can't quite lend yourself 10 bucks and charge money on that. Say, okay, well, 18%, I'm gonna charge myself 18% on letting myself 10%, 10 bucks. How does that work? Um, it's quite interesting. So they just give the money to the production company, production company goes spends the money, and then, by the way, they have nothing to do with the IT. Once the money's getting into the production company, it's up to the director and producers to figure out how to spend that money. And of course, they're not going to spend money on IT security or IT beyond what it is required to create the content. So there really is nothing there. Um, we're seeing more of these things happen because this all started with, like I said, non-targeted hacks. They just happen to stumble on, for example, Stephanie Myers, the lady who wrote Twilight, has been hacked multiple times, uh, and that is because they hacked her email address. That's it. He got into her email address, and through her email address, just looking at the content, it's everything you can possibly ever want because she has to be communicated everything going on in the film. So, again, this is a major issue, and not just for Hollywood, for any of the industries in here, this is a major issue. So data leaks even exist on Google. And this is one that I like to do all the time when I'm doing these talks in Hollywood because it, it really kind of blows their mind when you show them stuff like this. Uh, let me give you one example. Uh, here, I did some simple Google dorking, right? See it up there? Uh, and basically, all I did, I'm going to step out here so I can see, is I put in site colon Warner Brothers file type doc and what else did I put in there? Potter. Okay. And, uh, we have a few results here that come back that are Word documents that are sitting at a Warner Brothers website that have the word Potter in it. Uh, of course, I'm talking about Harry. And, uh, in these documents, you will find some interesting information, especially since metadata is still inside of these documents, meaning deleted stuff. Anything that was deleted from these documents is still in these documents. They have not been properly redacted. Um, so there's all kinds of stuff we can find in there. And from there, I actually found this page. Uh, let's see. Yeah, see that? All right. So one of these Word documents had some links to a login. And then I went through and did the same thing, but using in URL login. And what you can see here is, if you didn't know anything about anything, and you're trying to target Warner Brothers, we have all kinds of logins to all kinds of sites, such as the Star Wars virtual operating system, uh, such as the director login for Warner Brothers, uh, such as, you know, their community screening events, so you can screen movies online. Of course, these are not movies that you're supposed to be seeing. They're not yet released. And there's pages and pages of this stuff, right? As you can see. These are all logins to different Warner Brothers resources. So if we were enumerating and footprinting Warner Brothers to get hacked, there's a whole bunch of hosts here we can hack that we wouldn't have known about otherwise. Um, and from there, I found this. A Word document with links to some internal FTP site that has high quality Harry Potter video straight out of 
production. These are not promotional materials. These are not cut yet. These are straight up raw video in high quality of Harry Potter. Now, I, I picked Harry Potter so we wouldn't be showing you a movie that has yet to come out. Because um, obviously that would be unethical. Um, but you get the idea. I mean, it's ridiculous that this kind of information is this easily accessible for an industry that is so closed that you would think, oh, come on, it couldn't be. It could not be that we've got all kinds of UC clips up here. And of course, you could do this at Universal, you can do this at any one of these organizations. And I've, I've always found that there's a lot of different data here. So Google's great for all of this. And of course, there's other things. Now, hacking wetware. This is hacking the people. Like I said, this is really where it's at. Why? Because there is no way to patch human stupidity, and people will be stupid. They just will be. I don't know. Common sense is just not all that common. Um, you have sometimes two or three hundred people involved in the process of the making of a film. Okay, there's, yeah, all the actors and directors and producers, but then you should see it's a roving, moving city with 18 wheelers that have everything you can possibly ever think of and need related to that film. It's quite astonishing to watch this all go down. And it moves around from day to day depending on where you're filming. So hundreds of people involved in this process, all of them using personal email addresses, all of them using personal cell phones, personal laptops, personal iPads, all on set, all, of course, using Wi-Fi all over the place. You, you don't think there's some serious potential for leaks there? So when it happens, you wonder how it happened. Um, you know, take the Tarantino leak, for example. His latest project was, le the script was leaked and he only shared it with five people. Those five people were actors that he wanted to play in that movie. And even though it was physically shared with them, someone digitized it and sent it to one of their agents. And in that process, somebody was hacked, and it got leaked. Now, back to my first slide about the motive. In a co if we were going to talk about cost, what do you think the cost of that, which now Tarantino said, I'm not making the movie anymore. Because the script got out, I've been spending two years writing this thing, I'm not making the movie. Beyond the cost of what was lost in production, the money that they would have given them to make the movie, there's a lot of people's jobs who are now on the line because they're not making that movie. So, we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars, and that's not taking into consideration how well the movie may have done in the box office. So the hacking wetware is really where it's at when it comes to, to Hollywood. We hack the people, okay? And there really is, it's very difficult because the email threat is the biggest threat. And while spam, as we know it, has gone down to some degree, it's bounced back, and it's bounced back in a way that you know, I like to call weaponized email, because it's no longer just spam. It's now links to malicious sites with malicious code. Uh, you guys all heard about the Internet Explorer vulnerability that's out there that everybody's freaking out about. Now, that's a hell of a lot of computers that you could potentially write malware for and redirect people to a site, and then boom, you've got now access to not just Hollywood people. You've got access to potentially millions of people around the world's computers. Um, the U.S. is, however, the prime target, and it's the prime target. Um, one of the slides I had a few uh, ago before I was telling you about Twilight um, said some stuff about China. Now, I worked with these filmmakers who made a movie, which is not yet out. It's a documentary about Tibet, and they went out to Tibet, or tried to, anyway, um, during the Olympics in China, and uh, pretended to be carpet salesmen, and got themselves into the Tibetan area to interview uh, some monks, and they were working with the Dalai Lama's group, and so on and so forth. Um, I'm not going to tell you too much about it. It's a very interesting documentary. But what happened was, during the making of that, of that documentary, I got a call from one of these guys who said, we've been hacked by the Chinese. And he wasn't kidding. This hack was not a simple hack. This was a huge hack. They hacked everyone in the United States involved with it, including and you guys heard of this one, including a little girl, uh, not a little girl, but a student um, in college who was the leader of a Tibetan activist group who was communicating with them. And that lady's uh, email was hosted at Google. And you guys heard about this when Google said, we're pulling out of China as a result of that hack. Well, that's what this film was about. She was 
we determined that, Google determined that, um, but she was helping out with this film. So China, they say, well, what is the threat? It's a huge threat, not only to Hollywood, but to everyone. I've had, you know, not far from here in Oklahoma City, uh, had a client who got completely pwned by the Chinese, and I mean completely pwned. He didn't even know until the Chinese decided that they had enough data and, uh, again, beyond monetizing, because this is more intelligence, and they decided, you know what, we're going to start trolling. So they locked him out of their entire system. No administrative access, all users were gone, the whole domain controller had been wiped away. And they literally had to rebuild the entire network from scratch. So the U.S. is the prime target, not only for intelligence and monetizing hacks, but other things. In another situation, and imagine if this happened to you, we've seen this ransomware stuff, right? You guys have all seen this, right? Um, CyberLocker and the FBI one, where uh, this, is, this is serious stuff because if it gets on your server or gets, for example, on a laptop of one of these production folks who happens to just the DIT guy who's carrying the film over, their entire hard drive is encrypted until they pay. And there's a countdown with like the cyber locker one that is counting down. And if you don't pay them their $300, um, your data is gone. And trust me, we've tried to do forensics on this. And no, it's, it's pretty much pretty locked up. So ransomware is a serious issue for anyone as well. And again, the problem is, is that the weakest link is the people and they fall for this sort of thing. This is the most increase, increasing vector uh, of attacks has to do with just targeting the human psyche here and the human's uh, stupidity, as I said before. Um, we really are still not doing enough. In this chart, they, same report, they asked, what are the most effective security practices that your organization is doing, internal or external threats? And you'll notice that, you know, we got firewalls up there and encryption and VPNs and you name it. All the stuff we all hear and talk about and have to implement in our organizations. However, notice all the way at the end of this is end user awareness. This is, they literally answered that end user awareness was the least successful practice that they had. Which, what that tells us is we really are not doing enough to, to teach others about the problems in security. You know, it's great that we're all here. It's great that we're all talking. But we're not the biggest problem. The biggest problem in security is the consumers. And, you know, it's my mom. It's my dad. How many, how many of you get a call from your mom or dad <laughs> all the time with, my computer's acting slow? Uh, you know, I think I have a virus. Uh, and, of course, we're the technical support department for them. So uh, we have to deal with this all, all the time. So... Last but not least, I want to talk about Spielberg here for a second, and uh, actually George Lucas, two major names in Hollywood. In 2013, Spielberg predicted at a UCLA, or so, I forget if it was UCLA or another university, that he was talking about the implosion of the film industry as a result of six major $200 million budget films failing at the box office. Okay, we've already seen some major failures at the box office with several hundred million dollar films. But he's saying that in one year, six major movies are going to come out that are going to bomb at the box office. They're not going to make the money. By the way, Hollywood bets on the first three weekends. That's it. They have all kinds of other deals that I can tell you about, but the first three weekends of box office sales is what they bet on. They, they look at that as being the, the main thing of how well a movie does. So... What do you think, now Spielberg didn't say this, and then George Lucas came right behind him a couple of weeks later speaking at USC and said the same thing. He said, I agree with Spielberg, there's going to be a major implosion that's going to change the film industry as we know it. As a result of six major films, or whatever, several hundred million dollar films, bombing. Okay, now, as IT people, do you think that's only going to be, that's going to happen as a result of the movies just sucking? It's possible because there's some big movies that suck. Um, but if you ask me, it's not going to be just because of that. I think, and I predict here and today, that it's going to happen as a result of some of these movies getting out on the Internet before the release date, before box office releases. And if that happens, 
people ain't going to go see them. And if they suck, they're really not going to go see them. So this is going to happen. And you didn't hear, you didn't hear the news cover this very much. You got Steven Spielberg, for God's sake, talking and saying that the film industry is going to implode on itself. And for the most part, they just don't want to hear it. They covered it for a little bit, and then they just, just stick it under there. I don't want to talk about that. Um, but so that's, that's Hollywood as I see it right now. Um, again, this has been an interesting and strange trip from, you know, starting at 14, playing around with a Commodore 64 and BBSs, to all of a sudden working with all these famous people. Uh, and here's the great thing about it, you guys. They find us more interesting than themselves. They think hackers are the coolest thing since sliced bread. And this could be anyone from John Travolta to Oliver to, you know, Benicio Del Toro, all these people I worked with would want to spend hours upon hours talking about hacking. That was what they were interested in talking about. Well, I wanted to find out, hey, how was it making heat? And well, you know, how was it doing that? Oh, they just wanted to talk about hacking. They thought it was the coolest thing ever. Um, so this is a, a, an area that you're going to see a lot more films being made too. Uh, and so that, that's a whole new world for us, you know, being a technical consultant to a film. I mean, they really do need the help because how many times have we seen a movie and sat there and go, what the hell is that screen? What kind of computer is that? Uh, it's all the time. So, uh, in fact, that was one of the things I was really proud of when we made Savages was, you know, I got my five seconds or ten seconds of fame in the movie, you know, 27 and a half minutes in. I'm Wiley the sound guy. That's my scene. Uh, but that was not really why I was there. I was there to consult Oliver and tell him, you got to change these lines because hackers don't talk like that. Okay? And his words to me was, well, I don't know. I'm just a writer. I'm making it up. And that's true. They're making it up. So uh, they need help. And, uh, and we're more than happy to give them help because it's a really interesting world to watch. But the thing I liked the most was I literally had friends ship me um, DEF CON badges and all kinds of different stuff from the real world to put it on set to make sure that it felt real, that it looked real, that the screens looked real, and that the actors didn't sound like idiots when they were saying, you know, oh, it's encrypted, as they usually will. So uh, it, it, it was a lot of fun, and it's still a lot of fun playing around in this world. So Hollywood is very vulnerable, and you are going to see a whole new world and a whole new market open up in Hollywood for us. It doesn't currently exist. It is in the process of its creation, uh, which is people who can focus on this content and following the content. So with that said, don't feed the trolls, okay, um, which is what Hollywood does. They are feeding the trolls. They are just, they're, they're about to get a big wake up in the next year or two. I can tell you that from, from our intelligence of what's going on and the communications that we're seeing, and not just from China, but from all kinds of different places as they're trying to figure out how to monetize the fact that they have gotten access to such content. So uh, that's pretty much it uh, when it comes to Hollywood. Uh, it, like I said, it's been a real interesting ride so far here, and it's just beginning because there's a lot of crossover between our experiences uh, and our knowledge in securing environments and systems and our experience and knowledge as content. Um, so it, it's a real interesting uh, situation to be in for all of us who are doing this to really mitigate a lot of the risks involved with computing systems. But at the same time, the stories and the things that we go through are the sort of things that movies are made of. Uh, of course, they don't really want to see us sitting there for 20 hours. That, that part is not so cool. But uh, they figure that out on their end. Um, but, I mean, it, like I said, it, it really is just even today, I mean, when Dave, when I first met Dave, uh, you know, five, six years ago, I used to tell him, this is not even, this industry is not even at baby stages yet. It really is still in the womb. And just now, now we can talk five, six years, now we're dealing with a baby. It is still a massively growing field, and there's so much more to go. It, maybe in the next five or ten years, it'll be in its teenage years. But even still today, it's a baby uh, across the board in all industries. So, you know, again, Hollywood being no different. And, uh, and again, for me to be up here talking to you guys after, you know, doing all this stuff that you guys are doing today and then somehow end up working with 
these big names, these big directors, these big actors, and they have no clue, no clue about computers and security. Uh, and they don't even have the staff to support them. They don't even have the, the infrastructure to provide security for them. Uh, it, it's just crazy. So uh, kind of giving it away. Now, with that said, I'll tell you something I don't talk about very much, which is, which is what I've been doing with them and, and working on. I call it context inspection. What I've been working on is designing software that looks at traffic uh, in the perspective of context, not what flags are turned on, is it stateful, is it looking at all of the communications across the workflow process and looking at the context in which those communications are happening. Building a baseline and then basically alerting if anything deviates from the baseline. So I'll give you a simple example. You know, um, Jason and I send each other pictures all the time. They're always of Jason, of course, giving awkward hugs. But uh, that's the context. This is how Jason and Ralph typically communicate. And if all of a sudden I start now seeing that Jason is sending really long emails or sending uh, really large images or video, it's going to see that as a deviation from context. And it's going to say, hey, you know, Jason's now sending you stuff he doesn't normally send you. And that's enough for us to look into it from an incident response perspective. And the whole trick is to be prepared to deal with it, to actually be able to take that data to court. It takes three to four months in all of these cases to, to be able to get the data because we have to subpoena the data. You know, go to Gmail. Hey, give me the logs for this. Go to Hotmail. Give me the logs for this. So it is really a, 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 a real pain in the butt to go that route. So think about it this way. It's not about intrusion prevention or detection so much as it is as intrusion resilience. You have to keep in mind that you will get hacked. It's inevitable. The question is how quickly can you identify that you've been hacked, number one. And then secondly, to have some sort of plan of action on how to deal with that. Make sure that if you've detected that you've been hacked, that you have the capabilities to have that data in a way that can be used in court and that doesn't require 50 different lawyers to go and subpoena this information from the ISPs. So that, for the most part, most of us really don't think about that. We only deal with the forensic aspect of it after the fact. So intrusion resilience, remember that. Start using that when you're talking to your uh, upper level management. It's about resilience. We will get hacked. Setting the expectation that we're doing everything we can to not get hacked, good. But setting the expectation that we will not be hacked, bad. You will get hacked. We will all get hacked in this room and beyond. In one way or another, some data of ours is already currently being hacked. Okay, so it's going to happen. The question is, how quickly can you identify it? With that said, thank you, guys. I, like I said, pleasure to be here. Thank you, Dave. Uh, thank you, St. Louis. And, uh, you know, anytime you're in Hollywood, give me a call. Thanks, Ralph. Um, does anybody have any questions for Mr. Echimendia? I know, oh, some, I know oh somebody's God. thinking it. Selma Hayek is that hot. Yeah, though. yeah, yeah. You know, uh, Mr. Street has a question for uh -oh, you. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Yes. All right. Any others? I had, Jason, I had to uh, talk about trolling while you're doing it. Um, I did this presentation at a content protection summit and clicked on the links, and they were still active. And there was a guy sitting in the, in the room from Warner Brothers, and he just got up and ran out of the room. <laughs> and I literally said, he must be from Warner Brothers. <laughs> All right, one, one question over here. Absolutely. Absolutely. DreamWorks and Pixar. Um, are a lot more, a lot different than the majority of the bigger studios. Um, and they're, as big, as big as they are, they're considered like the smaller production houses. Uh, even though DreamWorks and Pixar are huge, they still work with the Universal, they still work with the bigger studios for distribution. Um, but they are a lot tighter. However, the, generally, the, the way that they see things there is that nothing is connected to the internet. And so, Nothing that's used for creative development is connected to the internet. So the way that they tend to think about it is, oh, we're, 
we're pretty secure because those servers, those systems are sitting behind a room that's not connected to the internet at all. Uh, but if you know anything, you have to realize that even though it's not an internet connected system, there is still vulnerabilities, there's still potential risk there. Um, the way they address that is a lot of physical security. So uh, you, you'd be surprised that you can drop USB sticks on the parking lot of a bank and you're almost guaranteed that some employee is going to plug it into a banking system. Not so with a DreamWorks or Pixar. They really have serious policies that they follow when it comes to that issue. So, Thank you. Anybody else? One in the back. You know, it, it, it's a great question. And it's a question that I, I, I ask all the time. Well, here's the biggest problem. It's a, it's a structural business issue, right? CIO, this, is, this will blow your mind. The CIO and CTO of Fox Entertainment uh, until recently at a conference had never met each other. Don't talk to each other. How can that be? CTO and the CIO, they should, don't they interact? No. The CTO's responsibility is strictly whether or not they should be using 4K cameras for filming, what they, you know, what Blu-ray and all of that stuff. And the CIO is all about the operations of the studio, not the production, right? So there's this major disconnect on whose responsibility is it, right? So you go ask these guys and they go, well, it's not my, it's not my problem. It's that guy's problem. Then you go to the CIO and he goes, it's not my problem. I have nothing to do with that. And they go back to the CTO and go, well, he said it's not his problem. So whose problem is this? And they go, well, you know what? It's the directors and producers problem. Go talk to them. And then you go talk to the directors and producers and they're like, uh, we make movies. I don't know what you're talking about. The, uh, as far as we're concerned, we just use hard drives. Are you talking about the hard drives? Yeah, the hard drives. That's literally all they know. And their perspective is, again, since there's no IT there, that's the major disconnect, right? So it's going to take a Spielberg to even Spielberg to say major implosion, but again, they don't really understand why that is. Like I said, it makes a lot more sense to me that that implosion is going to happen as a result of a leak or several major leaks, not just that the movie sucks. So that's, that's the issue. Is there's a lot of this going on, and uh, in Hollywood, it's not unlike in a lot of other corporate environments, they don't want to make a decision because they are afraid to lose their jobs. Over there, they, you know, Hollywood very much is that way that if you make a decision and you put something on TV and it sucks, you're gone, right, if you're a development executive. Same thing applies for everybody else. They're like, well, if we don't make a decision, we can't lose our job. So right, that's the biggest you know, hurdle to overcome over there is that they're still doing this. Not our problem, not our problem. Look at them. And in the meantime, like I said, the, the vulnerability is there, but the market doesn't quite exist yet. So, you know. That's why I think, you know, to some degree I'm, I'm trailblazing there because I'm getting in front of their faces and doing these type of things. Typically, as part of this presentation, what I'll do beyond the little phone trick is I'll actually hack the organizer. I didn't want to do that to Dave because it Thank doesn't you. even make any, but I'll hack the organizer of the content protection and piracy summit in Hollywood and I'll hack their assistants and I'll show how a Trojan works, how I installed the Trojan. And then the funniest part is when you, they, when you start showing the, the file structure and, oh, look at their files, they're still kind of looking like, huh, they don't quite get it. Then I turn on their microphone and turn on their camera at the office, and they're like, holy crap. And it takes that for them to start realizing how much of a problem they really got. You know? Finance, healthcare, they've all got things like PCI and HIPAA and, that are pushing the envelope on having to have a solution. Not the case with content creation so awesome thanks Ralph uh, we'll take a break